Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. Today I'm going to dive into a subject which is you know, probably not going to get me the most views, it's probably not going to go viral or something like that, but I think is important for a certain group of people and it's something that I see misconceptions about. In fact, I've seen uh, some kind of schemes marketed uh, which are not valid uh, lately and so I wanted to dive into it and that is the subject of how trusts are taxed, okay? So we're going to dive into this quickly. Before we get into that, and I'll try to go through all the details for you. So again, stick around and tell me what you think at the end. Uh, click the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Click the notification bell. Uh, it really helps us out, really appreciate it. You know, if you like our videos, please subscribe. Please check out more of them. Please share them with your friends. We really, uh, you know, we're trying to grow it and try to deliver you good information. So, uh, and then if you're interested in this subject at all, that is to say asset protection, tax planning, uh, banking, corporate structure formation, payment processing, residencies, citizenships, international investing, all that kind of stuff, then by all means, reach out to us. You can book a call with me, clarity.fm forward slash Michael Rosmer. There's a link below. Uh, or you can check out our websites, offshorecitizen.net, offshorecapitalist.com. Okay, let's go. So what is the situation when it comes to how trusts are taxed? So this is a little bit of a confusing thing for a lot of people, in part because of the fact that a trust, as I've talked about, you can check out some of our other videos where I kind of explain a little bit about how trusts work, but they're not necessarily a legal entity. It's more like a relationship between parties. Uh, they're sometimes treated as a legal entity, but it's not, a trust is not intrinsically, in a lot of parts of the world, uh, a legal entity. In fact, in a lot of parts of the world, a trust is not recognized at all. And so this becomes fairly important in order to regard uh, what taxation takes place. And so just to recap for you, in a trust there are basically three meaningful roles, okay? There is the settler or grantor, who is the person who sets up the trust and puts the assets in initially. There's the trustee who holds those assets and manages them in trust uh, for the purposes of the beneficiary, okay? The beneficiary is the people where it ultimately goes to. Now, as you can see, because there's three people, you might think, okay, well, where is that taxable? Is it taxable at the beneficiary level? Is it taxable at the uh, trustee level? Uh, which is typically kind of the trustee is the trust, right? When we're saying that we're referring really to the trust because it's the trust assets usually are taxable paying that out. Uh, or is it at the settler grantor level? Okay. Now, this is a little bit interesting because of the fact that it depends on the way the trust is set up in most cases. Okay, so let's use an example. If I put assets into trust and the trust is what's called revocable, meaning that I can basically undo the trust, I can take them back, then generally those assets are taxable to me. Okay, I'm making some generalizations here. You have to look country by country. As I said, in some countries they don't have tax uh, trusts. So then you have to kind of look at case law to figure out how it is that they're taxed. For instance, Spain, right? And we'll use Spain as an example as we go forward because it's kind of relevant. So that's one, one scenario, right? Another is we say, okay, it's irrevocable, meaning I'm putting the assets into trust, and okay, great, they're, they're in trust. I can't take them out, right? Well, does that mean that they're still taxable to me? Does that mean that they are taxable to the trustee? Does it mean they're taxable to the beneficiary? How does that work, right? The, and now we start to get into the next part, which is, okay, do the assets clearly pay out some sort of uh, like a, a return to the beneficiaries directly or do those assets uh, accumulate in trust and then get distributed later? Okay, that's kind of the, the nature of it and you might kind of go through the last part which is if you have multiple beneficiaries, is it clear, are they clearly divided between say three people or is it that they're uh, discretionary, like it can vary. It could be more to one and less to another and none to somebody else, okay? Those factors are, generally speaking, what we're going to look at when we pay attention to how it is that they're taxed, okay? And the misnomer, the fallacy that I hear people talk about is they kind of have this idea that it's like, oh, hey, so long as it's not paid out, there's no taxable event. And that's very often not true. It might be true, right? But most of the time, a lot of the time, it's not true, okay? So here we go. There are typically two scenarios under which the grantor or the settler would remain taxable, okay? The first is if it's a revocable trust, then typically uh, it would remain taxable to the grantor or settler. Not always, right? I don't want to, the reality is there's lots of countries in the world, right? Lots of ways that trusts can be interpreted. 
but generally speaking, in that scenario, it could be, uh, could be taxable to the grantor, okay? The next scenario is that under which it could be taxable to the grantor is if it is somehow deemed that a transfer has not taken place yet, okay? So I'm gonna give you the example of Spain here. Spain, because there are no trusts in Spain, treats a trust like a, a partnership, okay? And so the key distinction in Spanish rules is they're trying to figure out when did the transfer take place? Basically what they do is they remove the trust, okay? So they basically just have the two parties, the grantor or the settler and the beneficiaries. And they say, okay, when did the transfer actually take place? When the transfer took place, uh, if it you know, hasn't taken place yet, then it's taxable to the grantor settler. If it has taken place, then it's taxable to the beneficiaries. And that's kind of the general idea if you go and read up on the case law about it, okay? All right, perfect. So that's the, the other scenario. Now, then we have the scenarios where you say, okay, great. Uh, what, was, what would often happen is that a trust, the transfer into a trust might be considered a gift. Okay, so we could use, for example, the US rules, right? Uh, under the US rules, there's a certain, uh, for a, an American uh, or from US CITES, uh, there is a lifetime uh, limit on how much gift can be, uh, gifts can be given, okay? So typically, if I take that money as the grantor and I put it into trust, right? Let's just say it was $5 million, okay? And say I haven't used up my, my gift limit anywhere else. Uh, if, that, if it's just that principle that gets paid out to the beneficiaries, then there shouldn't be any tax. Why is that? Well, because that's after-tax money, okay? It's, just, it's like I was giving you a gift. So the trust is basically controlling how long that takes, what the process is by which that happens, but it doesn't change the material nature of the transaction. So generally speaking, when we're looking at common law jurisdictions where they do have trusts, the characteristic of the income is maintained. Okay, so a trust kind of flows it through. So if, for instance, you have a capital gain that takes place, it's not like it goes in, whereas if it was a corporation, Corporation has a capital gain, they realize the gain, then they pay out money that's a dividend or they pay out money as, say, a wage. The capital gains nature of it is not preserved. In this case, it is preserved, it flows through, okay? So the trust holds a property, the property gets sold, that money flows through to the beneficiaries. The characteristic of it, which is capital gains income, flows through to the beneficiaries, okay? Make sense? All right, now, there's two scenarios that we can have here. Right? The one scenario is we say, okay, uh, or well, let's start with, as I mentioned, the whole thing is if it's just money has been put into trust, there's no gains, and it just gets paid out, then it's fairly clear, right? It's basically just a transfer from one to the other. So, you know, again, you can figure out, okay, when did it get transferred, but more or less it's just a transfer. Where we get into complications is when we put assets that grow into a trust, okay? So maybe I'm gonna put in stocks, maybe I'm gonna put in businesses, maybe I'm gonna put in uh, property, uh, gold, maybe I'm gonna put in cash, but then the cash is gonna be used to buy these things, etc. right? So there's some sort of actual profitability that is happening within this trust, okay? All right, fair enough. So now there's gains. So now the question becomes, all right, what if those gains are paid straight out to the beneficiaries? Well then generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, if they're immediately paid out to the beneficiaries, especially this will typically be determined by the rules of the trust, then in that scenario, it's going to be taxable to the beneficiaries, okay? The flip side is that you say, okay, it's not paid out immediately to the beneficiaries. It's uh, kept in the corpus, it's basically added to the corpus of the trust, the corpus being kind of the body, the assets of the trust. In that case, it would typically be taxable at the trust level, okay? Now, what the consequences of this are is that potentially this could lead to some sort of a deferral arrangement, okay? And if that's the case, then sometimes you're gonna end up in a situation where uh, as those assets add up within the trust, when they do get distributed, they may still be taxable to the beneficiaries, okay? So this would be a really common thing. If we look at the anti-avoidance rules uh, around trusts in Australia, there's quite, I think it's four or five anti-avoidance regimes uh, related to these uh, types of entities in Australia. 
And in those, there's almost no scenarios. There's basically one scenario under which you can defer, okay? If you defer uh, under that scenario, then it's gonna be taxable when it's received, okay? And then, you know, we can kind of deal with the other scenarios uh, as, they, as they rise. So I just wanted to mention this to you because of the fact that it's noteworthy that in tax in general, like income is gonna get taxed. So usually the idea is if income has already been taxed, okay, uh, at like a personal level, then a transfer often will have some sort of a limit under which it's not taxed. And we've talked about gift as a big exemption. And that, that's kind of why, right? If I receive money from my company, I pay all my tax on it, the company's paid their tax, then whether I give that money, like whether I'm spending that on somebody else or whether I'm spending it on myself, really doesn't matter, right? It's kind of immaterial. If we're in a situation where uh, the tax has not been paid, right, then the fact that it flows from A to B to C, and it's not paid at B, then it's gonna make sense that it's paid at uh, C, right? The fallacy that some people seem to have is they seem to have this idea that it's like, oh, hey, uh, what about this part in the middle? In the part in the middle, hey, a trust, a lot of people seem to have some idea that trusts somehow aren't taxable. Most of the time, trusts function and have kind of a taxability on their own. So in the absence of some other taxability, a trust could be taxed. Now, of course, if you're in a jurisdiction with no tax, then that's not the case, right? So you have to dive into the specifics here. And so there is certainly some really good tax planning you can do where you can say, okay, great, there may be a foreign trust and that trust is in a jurisdiction without uh, tax consequences and the assets are in a place that they're you know, growing without tax consequences and so you, know, you can defer there perpetually. It's also true that trusts are often used as charities and so then the charity may not have tax consequences or there are some other specially designed trusts. Uh, we sometimes use this in US domestic tax planning where uh, there's specific reasons why you're able to defer that income and therefore there isn't tax uh, until kind of the end event. So there are some cases like that, but generally speaking, the way that it works is there's not double tax. So this is like the difference I would say between uh, a corporation, right? So a corporation receives the income, it pays tax, then it pays out a distribution after tax, right? And that after tax distribution then becomes taxable in the hands of the shareholder who receives it. In the case of a trust, the income flows in, it's not tax, if it is taxable at the trust level, then it's not taxable usually at the beneficiary level. Whereas if it isn't taxable, or if it is taxable at the beneficiary level, then it's usually not taxable at the uh, trust level. So it's again, designed to kind of flow through. So anyway, I hope that kind of gives a sense. I hope I was fairly clear there. If you have questions, please put them in the comments. If you like the video, please click the, the like button. I mean, click the subscribe button if you haven't done so already in general. I'm big on liking subscribers. Subscribers are great. At, uh, you're wonderful. Anyway, uh, if you want help with any of this kind of thing, please reach out to me, clarity.fm forward slash Michael Rosmer. You can book a call with me. Uh, check out our websites, offshorecitizen.net, offshorecapitalist.com. Share these things with anyone who might, uh, might need some assistance. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you guys on the next video.